Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live. I'm your host Viz and today we welcome Josh Rubin, Sarah Lynn, writer, director Travis Stevens from the movie A Wounded Fawn, which is now streaming exclusively on on Shudder. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, you have a busy day ahead of you, so let's get right to it. Travis, I want to go ahead and get started with you. The film is told from uh, Josh's character, Bruce, a slightly disturbed individual, uh, to say the least. Did uh, the way you envision Bruce before you started co-writing this script was exactly how you ended up when it was done, or did you have to make a lot of changes along the way? That's a good question. I, I guess I think of it as uh, similar to when you bake bread. You might have a recipe, you might have the same ingredients, but when you put it in the oven, it's going to come out slightly different uh, each time. And, you know, Josh's version of Bruce uh, had so many different uh, sort of sparks to it that I never imagined. I think there's there's uh, his playfulness uh, as a performer is something that, that really sort of uh, made that character so much more interesting than, than even conceived. Um, I absolutely agree. Josh, you did a brilliant job playing this character. And my question to you is, Bruce, being this complicated character, uh, what were your thoughts when you read the script? And what was your approach on how you were going to play him? Thank you. I mean, just that it was fun as hell. Uh, I love the Jalo homage of it all and knowing that it was going to be a practical effects movie. Um, but it was it, it read like a dream role. You get to play the bully, the intimidator, the narcissist that then gets terrorized and raked over the coals. Like, what's not to love about that? That it's, you know, a feminist film that I get to play the punching bag. After also getting to do the fun stuff of the stunts and kills with the exotic weapon and all that good stuff. So for me, the only acting challenge was like trying not to get caught being funny, um, not to go for laughs, uh, to bring out an element of, you know, uh, uh, mania, not through a comedic lens, but through more, you know, the lens of a, of a head wound and paranoia. Um, that was that was the that was the the effort for me. Okay, gotcha. Now, uh, Sarah Meredith, that's her character, is coming off a traumatic relationship. Uh, why do you think Meredith agrees to go to this secluded cabin with someone she barely even knows? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um... I think it's reasonable to assume that you're not going to get murdered, even if you are going to a secluded cabin. So I think there's that. Though, of course, there's some risk to going to some, you know, other location or whatever, like some secluded place with someone you don't know. But I think they've had enough dates. They've gotten to know each other well enough that it's reasonable to think that she's probably safe um i it, it's interesting that like even even in his kills bruce or, or with the victims we see in the mm -hmm. movie bruce doesn't have sex with any of no. either of the women he kills in this movie and never really makes um uh a, a, a very like a, a really clear advance sort of sexually and not that that's like i i think that that could be one of the reasons why why meredith is like you know, he's taking it slow, like me. Like, he's not, like, too pushy. He's, he's nice. This is all, like, going at a nice pace. And and it puts you at a comfort level. That's totally understandable. You have a great line in the first act of the film where your friends ask you, what are you doing for the weekend? And you basically flat out tell them, I'm going to go get laid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. truth, honest, and it was great. And it really... Do you think that lends to the mindset of... Uh, of Meredith and basically her personal life. Is she a kind of person that needs to be in a relationship coming off one bad relationship, trying to get into another one to feel whole? 
I don't think so at all. Um, I, th I think that it's been a long time since uh, the last relationship or, you know, like a healthy amount of time for her to work through what, what that was so that she could start dating again. And, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about, you know, the relationship of Meredith and Bruce, Bruce in this movie is that neither one of them is like, we're going to marry each other. Oh, we're in love. Oh, or they're already in a relation. It's just a date. Like she's yeah. just going on a nice date and that's pretty unusual um in in a, in a lot of movies you usually sort of like you know it's like the the, the big love or it's like a capital r relationship so absolutely just like yeah looking to have some fun absolutely <laughs> now travis there's a lot of symbolism in this film uh josh mentioned all the practical effects uh tell us what those figures that we see that are obviously in uh, Bruce's head. What do they mean? Uh, do they have a specific meaning or do you want to leave it up to the viewers to interpret their own meaning? Well, I don't want to handicap this podcast, <laughs> but yeah, I think we should probably let the people sort of uh, uh, experience the film and, and come to their own conclusions on that. Okay, uh, okay, that that's fair. Now, Josh, Bruce states that he never intends or starts off to harm women, um, but he succumbs to the voices in his head to which he has even given its own identity. He, It's a person to him that lives inside his head. Is he telling the truth when he says that he never intends to harm any women when he first meets them? I mean, would a tarantula tell a cricket <laughs> like, you know, you're totally cool to walk by my little my little trapdoor of leaves? No. Uh no. <laughs> uh sorry, I'm not a scientist. Um, but I love I, I love planet earth <laughs> uh oh no it's all a lie it's all part of his narcissistic narrative uh, uh like many of the narcissistic char characters i think in my life and all our lives who don't murder um uh they do uh they do lie ad finitum and um much of their lives are lies there's nothing worse than the exposing of the vulnerable self which is what's so extravagant about act two of this is you get to see the ultimate narcissist regardless of the murder of it all expose their raw nerve um and be chased and terrorized <clears throat> before even his own demise that's mm -hmm. that's the worst of it uh no everything everything is a veneer and that was, was was so fun about playing this this part before we even meet the Furies. You're meeting a character who's playing a mask. Bruce is Bruce is masking what he really is from the get go. Yeah. Now uh, it's very hard to put a label on Bruce. I'm talking about is he a sociopath? Is he schizophrenic? Etc. Uh, what's your take on that aspect? I, I mean, I didn't get the whole psychopath sociopath vibe from him. I think he's just somebody who's suffering from a very severe mental illness. Well, it's not for me to examine uh, or uh, or diagnose, but I'd love to do one of those whatever. We all we all get on Vanity Fair as as uh, as who we are and talk to an actual forensic psychologist or psychiatrist and get their take and have us all just kind of sit at the round table in our a nice clothes <laughs> and say, wow, that's so cool. I didn't think of that. It's, it's just not for me to diagnose. I'm not, not nearly as educated, uh, nor I probably shouldn't say as interested. I just knew that the challenge or the role was he, uh, uh, he's masked. He is faking it. He's the tarantula under the trap door mm -hmm. uh, or under the, uh, uh, under, under the camouflage. Um, and, um, uh, he's, he's containing all of it. He's clearly a very, very angry person. I don't even think he's as uh, he's as remorseful as Dahmer, who tried to drown out the voices with alcohol. I think he's he's living a very angry life for for what that that uh, observation is worth. And there's one line in the movie uh, that it's not really a spoiler unless you have context where you say, "This is what I re this is the part I really enjoy." I think that that those few words sort of yeah. give us a really deep insight into your character. <laughs> 
Now, uh, Sarah, during the final act, when Bruce is in, I mean, he's just full blown over the cliff in his own little world. Uh, again, this movie leaves up, uh, leaves a lot up to viewer interpretation, but do you think Meredith is sort of leading him along this halluc- hallucination, whatever you want to call it, path he's on, or is she just sitting back and watching what's he, what is he doing? Um, that's a good question. And it definitely is up to interpretation. I think in, in my mind, I think like what's really happening or whatever is that uh, is something quite straightforward, but through um, the, the brain trauma that Bruce has experienced and his like grandiose delusions, uh, he's viewing it in this like very heightened and self-important way when I, I think that really there's a woman there who he has not managed to completely destroy who's mm-hmm. like hey <laughs> uh look what you did yeah. you did this and so you know in terms of like what the audience thinks is happening that's that's up to you know all of us to to determine but i think at least when i was playing meredith it was it was pretty simple i don't think she yeah. would have been aware necessarily of like you know the the deities involved in this delusion and all that and it will leave a lot of viewers asking themselves what part does meredith play throughout the entirety of that third act i mean it left me very intrigued now travis let's talk about the end credits uh not in detail but the end credits are not your normal uh ending of a film uh I will admit I don't watch the entirety of end credits, but I made the exception for this film. Uh, when did you know you wanted to uh, end the film the way you did? Uh, and like I said, we're not giving away any spoilers. We're trying to be as cryptic as possible. But when people see the movie, they'll understand the question. Yeah, I. Uh, it's interesting. I. It has become clear to me this year that my I don't pay attention to when I decide these things because <laughs> Sarah was like, oh, I think you decided that while you were working on the script. And I just have no no recollection of, of when, but it, it definitely was uh, something that by the time we, we were ready to film it, um, we were ready for. And when you make a decision that bold uh you never quite know if it's going to land so every time uh somebody mentions it it feels like uh we we got a high five from, oh yeah from now cinema lovers josh uh you being a part of those end credit scenes it looks like you were kind of having some fun there in the dirt on the ground uh i, I really was <laughs> <laughs> uh you know how much time, Josh, how much time did this film take to film from start to finish? My involvement, I mean, the filming of it was, oh gosh, what, 28 days? Most of which were overnights? Something yeah, like yeah, the, the majority of the film is in, in done overnight. Now, there is sort of a, I'm going to throw this question out there, like a paranormal possible aspect to this film. Now... This relates to Meredith's character. Uh, I'm going to ask Sarah this question. Do you think that Meredith is seeing the spirits of Bruce's past victims? What's your take on that particular aspect of this film? Oh, we lost your audio. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, I think what I'm about to say might actually contradict what I said earlier a little bit, but I think she does is getting warnings those spooky little warnings from either the the spirits of the of uh kate and lenora yeah or from the furies themselves okay um, yeah um that yeah may- but i think it's kind of a fun movie in that like may they're may they're furies and they're also not furies all at the same time if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely now travis we're almost out of time i want to throw the last question to you the movie starts off at an auction house 
where Bruce is doing part of the bidding on a very bizarre, unique uh, piece of art, let's call it. Uh, what do you think, or what would you like the audience to think? I know, you know, you want to leave it up to them, but what does that object, that piece of art, mean to Bruce, and it's so important for him, and the lengths that he goes to get it? I think for somebody, a personality type like Bruce's, his actual emotional connection to the object is probably uh, impacted severely by other people's uh, views on the object. And I think as a device, it allows us to see that what Bruce really wants is to be the winner mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to be the loser. So the specificity of what the object is probably isn't as important as winning the object for him. And that feeds right into his whole uh, narcissistic personality as well. Guys, I want to thank you so much for coming on here and sharing just a little bit of the story behind a wounded fawn. For our audience who's watching this live and those of you who'll be watching this later on, the movie's called The Wounded Fawn. It is streaming right now exclusively on Shudder. Uh, I loved it. It's a great film. It's going to have you walk away with... Uh, your own interpretations, your own questions, please check it out. I want to thank our guests, Josh Rubin, Sarah Lind, and writer, director, producer, Travis Stevens. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to our audience. Until next time, stay walking. Bye, everybody.